do you remember the Shire, Mr. Fall? It'll be spring soon. The orchards will be in blossom. And the birds will be nesting in the hazel thicket. And they'll be sowing the summer barley in the lower fields. And eating the first of the strawberries with cream. Do you remember the taste of strawberries? Sam, I can't recall the taste of food. Nor the sound of water. Touch of grass. Naked in the dark. There's, there's nothing, no veil between me and the wheel of fire. Then let us be rid of it. Once and for all. Come on, Mr. Frodo. I can't carry it for you. But I can carry you. Come on! an attempt or even make every attempt not to solve people's problems or try to provide theological treaties on things. Oops. Next, what did she say? She also said that it's a, to provide people with emphatic listening. I remember uh, April, like uh, you and I were actually having this little debate. Is it empathetic listening or empathic listening? Apparently it's empathic listening. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, oh, right? All right, so empathic listening. What does that mean? It means that uh, you're supposed to be an active listener. Not just to provide advice, not to say anything, but more like as provide them with a mirror of themselves. Now, coincidentally, it's interesting because this past Friday, uh, the ministry that I do in downtown, we just launched a, new, a project called Free Listening. It's called the Free Listening Movement. Uh, apparently, it's a North American movement, except that BC is not even on the board, you know, on this. So why not just take the initiative, right? So free listening, what it does is that we just put up a cardboard in a high traffic area in the Vancouver Public Library and say, free listening, and then we just sit there. And then, so that on this past Friday, we had two people come up to us and say, what's this? And I would like to be heard. And then I go, and then we, but we went, four of us go, okay. So we just sat there. And they just kept talking. We go, oh. And then, you know, we were trying to practice our active listening, asking questions, see how they feel, what's their perspective, how did they feel again, what's your, what, you know, et cetera. People want to be connected. Um, there was this, um, just to go off on a tangent, if you now notice what the United Way's focus is now, uh, you know, if you look at the downtown signs, what do they say? One of the signs would say, 26,000 plus people are lonely. If you think you're lonely, sitting there at the bus stop, there's 26,000 plus elderly that are much more lonely, sitting there without anyone to connect. That's their emphasis this, past, this year. Interesting, right? Is this whole desire for community. Okay, now, last week, what did we talk about? Last week, there was this big, humongous, hairy spider on the screen, right? Remember that? And why, why, why did I do that? Well, we were talking about fears, right? And how fears could hinder people's recovery from pain, right? Uh, we said that we dealt a little bit in the physiological, psychosomatic way of how fear can actually hinder people's uh, recovery from pain. But I also talked about, okay, but how do we disarm this fear in a biblical way? How do we disarm it? And I offered an argument saying that because in order to disarm it, we have to have one big fear, and that is the fear of God. If we fear God, we disarm all other fears. Why do I say that? It's because God is super awesome and powerful. Nothing can stop him. And we, we always describe him as this unfailing love for us. So here's how, here's how I elaborate. God is unstoppable. 
God is not powerful. He defeated death. He defeated all things. So if we only fear him, we don't need to fear anything else. Agree? And then, but then, the, ironically, the ironic twist is, it's not the fear that we think of uh, usually with a, like, fear as in fearing a parent that would punish us and whip us with a tantu, right? It's not that type of fear, right? It's more about, uh, ironically, it's not that at all. No fear of punishment, no fear of, like, retribution or anything. Because, on the flip side, we explore First John, he says, because this God that we fear loves us very much and has paid a dear price for us. He died for our sins. So yes, we are to fear him, but we also know that this, birth, this God is a loving God. And therefore, we find comfort in him. So how do we navigate this then? It means that when this God has this unfailing love, whom we fear, it means that in response, we are to revere him. We are to respect him. And we are to live a life according to what he would like us to live. To live a life that is God-fearing. Remember that term? If you know that term? This is what it means to be God-fearing. It means to respect the unfailing love that he has for us. To actually receive it well. Receive that unfailing love well. That's what it means to be God-fearing. And that's what... And why do we live a life according to his will? It's because we are receiving his love well. That we understand what it means when we receive his unfailing love. That regardless of whether we sinned yesterday, regardless of how bad we think we sinned, regardless of how low we have fell or how low we went, we know that God is still loving us and still forgives us. And that's amazing. All right, now we move on to the next chapter, and we are now on the third, we are only on the final three sessions now, right? We're in the third one of the three. And if you have your Bibles, because uh, I hope you do, because uh, we don't have the screen up here, please turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. So I'll give you some time to uh, use your thumbs or whatever and just quickly do that. Romans chapter 12. But before we go into Romans 12, let me start with, with uh, the last few verses of Romans 11, starting with verse 33. So if you can do that, just the click and or tap and move over to Romans chapter 11. Okay, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable is his judgments and his paths beyond tracking out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same functions, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the, all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. However, there's actually a hidden word there. However, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patience in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. This is God's word. First, before I begin, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all 
who reached out to me to pray for me, pray for my mom, pray with me. Um, it was quite an ordeal during those uh, three weeks that she was at VGH. Uh, she had frequent fevers, bouts of pneumonia and infections. <laughs> seriously, we thought that we were witnessing the last days of my mom. Uh, I, I seriously thought that she, she, we were going to lose her. So one of the, those days uh, when I was at uh, VGH uh, in her room, I took a picture of the landscape outside her window. It was quite nice. And then for some odd reason, my phone, Google phone, like uh, decided to offer a black and white photo of that picture. And then I thought to myself, huh, right? Like, uh, I th and then I realized, and I reflected on that picture, and then actually I realized that that really reflected my heart at that time. That grayness, that hopelessness, that just confusion of what's going on. Uh, a lot of things were going in my mind that day. And uh, I shared with you when I was preaching, it was like things were just going all over the place in my head that day too. And so um, I decided, okay, I'll keep that picture and I'll post it on Facebook, right? And I didn't say any words, I just posted it. A lot of you reached out to me. I think Henry did, I think uh, Janice did, um, and then uh, a few of my friends on Facebook reached out to me offering prayer. And so I wanted to say thank you for uh, doing that. Thank you for offering me that prayer. So I asked myself this, uh, what is happening, why is this happening to my mom, right, during that time of reflection? You know, like, I bet that, you know, when they, when they were planning out the retirement years ago, you know, talking to their financial planner and stuff like that, you know, about having that picturesque retirement, I bet that they never pictured this, <laughs> right? I bet that, that they never had thought that this would happen, that my dad would end up grounded and not being able to travel what they wanted to, like, do go on their cruises and stuff like that, because, hey, you know, they've been dreaming of this all their lives to, to retire because they've been raising two freaking boys, <laughs> okay? They're always hungry, right? And they, they're always, like, you know, so, it's like, my dad always works overtime, and my mom's working as a real estate agent. She was working really hard, too, trying to make ends meet for my, for my brother and I. So if you think about it, they were really working hard to just get us out of the house, and finally, when they're out of the house, this happens to my mom. Right? How many of you would dream of that? Like, oh yeah, that's odd. Like, I'm going to just be wiping my spouse's like, you know, washroom accidents and everything, and uh, looking after her and visiting her at, like, uh, my, like in the morning and night, and then trying to tuck her in, and then she can't even acknowledge my, me that I'm in the room, that type of thing. How many of you picture that in your retirement? So I'm asking myself, why is this happening? Like, God, like these, like my parents were very godly. Uh, they, they, they served the church. My, my dad was an elder for Burnaby Alliance Church for like 12 years, right? My mom studied a M, uh, Master's of Christian Studies and she taught the, uh, Sunday school and she taught ESL for, for uh, immigrants at various churches. Why does this happen? Then I asked myself another question. The why after this, I go, okay, God, then how about me as a son? I'm lost now. I don't know how to take care of her. There's a lot of things I don't even know how to take care of her. Uh, she's too heavy for my, like, you know, she's, she has a lot of needs. She needs IV, she needs catheters, everything. How do I, as a son now, love her? How do I provide care for her? How do I, like, uh, give her, like, uh, the care that she needs that she feels loved, even though she cannot acknowledge that she's being loved? Those questions. You know, and so I sought it out, and we come to this passage in Romans 12. And, uh, and that's where we're going to go this morning. That through Romans 12, Paul actually gives us some pointers, myself some pointers, on how to provide care for those who are in need, or in our case, for those who are suffering, whether in physical, spiritual, relational, or mental pain. So let's go on. First, interesting enough, Every time we read a therefore in chapter 12, how many of you have memorized this verse before in Romans 12? Therefore, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Well, ever wonder why there's a therefore? It's because there's a truth before it. Paul, every time that he mentions a therefore, and the translators do a brilliant job, whenever they mention a therefore, there's, he, there's always a truth before that therefore that he wants to acknowledge. And what is that truth? Well, that is back in Romans 11, verse 33 to 36. So let's go to 33 to 36 in Romans 11. Paul starts off with this truth. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. 
Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God what God should repay them? 36. For from him and through him and for him are all things. Highlight that. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. True. Amen is true. Right? That's why amen means true. True that. You know, that's, the, that's, that's legit. That's, 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 I'm not going to share your password. Legit, right? <laughs> right? That's the legitimate statement. And then he goes to therefore. So to answer my question of why is this happening? Remember that question? Why is this happening to my mom? Why is this happening to our family? Why is this happening to my dad? Why the burdens? Best answer? Take a while, I guess. I don't know. Full stop. I don't know. I don't know the mind of the Lord. I don't know his, uh, who can fathom? Who has ever given to God? Who knows the mind of the Lord, right, in Isaiah? I don't know. That's the best answer. Paul says, you don't know, I don't know. However, is that a loving God? Just to leave us wallowing in that confusion? Wallowing with a big question mark over our heads every time we suffer and have pain? Is that, is that a loving God? No. So he doesn't leave us like there. He doesn't leave us uh, and say, oh, I don't know. Yeah, okay, you don't know. You're an ant. <laughs> right? You're gone, right? No, he doesn't leave us there. What kind of comfort God does God actually provide then? And this is where the truth that I told you to highlight. It's right here. For from him and through him and for him are all things. For from him and through him and for him are all things. Now, you see, so Paul goes on to say that because the suffering of my mom, my own suffering and pain, your suffering and pain, the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, relational that we all encounter should never make you or I feel like we're abandoned by God. Should never make you feel that you failed God. To never make you or I feel that we're on a life of tightrope and there's only way fell off. And that's why we're experiencing this. No, because, ev- because God is in you and he is in me and in you and we are in him, we are not abandoned. He is with us through him. This is what I mean by through him. It's because we are in him and he in us. He never leaves us. Just because uh, we are going through this suffering doesn't mean that he has departed or separated. You follow? Now, how about this for him? Right? It says for him. Well, all creation is for his purpose. Everything is for his purpose. So the suffering and the pain and the things that we are going through is for his purpose. You follow? It's like, um, it's like and then where is our best example? It's Jesus. When Jesus was suffering in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was on the cross, he could have saved himself. He could have said, no, this is a raw deal. I am not going to bear that burden, right? He was suffering. But did God leave him? No. God did not leave him. And nor was his suffering fruitless because we wouldn't be here without his suffering. Without his suffering on the cross, we wouldn't be here. The glory and the mercy and the love and the, and the grace that God has offered and, will, and is offering us through, his, his, through our sufferings, we become more aware and see that glory. We become more aware of his grace and mercy. The purpose of the suffering of the previous sermons that we, we discussed is that the purpose and the reason for this suffering is not to know why this is happening, it's know to what are we to respond. And how we should we respond is to open our eyes and seek out where is God showing his mercy and grace to us during our time of suffering? Where is he? Where is God when it hurts? Throughout that retreat, you probably learned some of that stuff too on how to meditate, how to re- uh, reflect, and how to go through Lectio Divina you know, during your suffering to know where God's presence is. And I hope you are practicing that. To understand where he is at, where he is in our sufferings. And so, that's amazing. It should be very amazing that it's not to leave us with this question mark saying, oh, only God knows. How many of us heard that? Lord knows, and then full stop. No, it doesn't end there. It means that there's more to it than that. Yes, you are suffering. He knows it, and he is suffering alongside with us, through him, but also for him, that all our suffering is for a purpose, just like Jesus. And then also there's an outcome for him, by him, for his purpose. There's an outcome. What is that purpose? For your redemption, for your full fellowship with God, for your full resurrection with God. 
you are aiming towards a renewed body, a full, glorious body with him. Amen? That's what it means. By for from him and through him and for him are all things. That everything comes together in the end for us. And that's where we find that comfort and hope. Now, how do we distribute that comfort to others? How do we care for others in light of that? So we move on. Paul is explains. Therefore, he says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. You see where that comes therefore now? You know, first this ultimate truth. And now he goes, okay, you guys understand this now. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, of showing you mercy and how to direct you, your bodies as living sacrifices, now offer your living, as living sacrifice to others, right? How does that work then? How, does that, how do we offer care for others by offering ourselves as living sacrifice to God? Here's a story then. I have a confession to make. There are countless of times when I do want to conform to the patterns of this world whenever I want to love my mom. How do I say that? Why do I say that? Well, think of it. I'm a very pragmatic person. And so going to my mom as, like, as a visitation to, 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 you know, just to be present, just to show up, right, doesn't make me feel that I'm fulfilling anything. Like, uh, I don't feel like I'm doing something, doing much, right? Sure, I'm wiping her, you know, tears when she's, you know, like, I think she's crying. Sure, I'm wiping her mouth. Sometimes she's, uh, her saliva's leaking. Sometimes, uh, you know, I, I get, wow, massage her feet. But then I'm like going, I have better things to do. <laughs> right? I have other things to do. People to see, right? Like places to go, meetings to fulfill, sermons to write, right? I have a lot of stuff on my plate, right? The world tells us that. Naturally, the world tells us, yeah, John, why are you doing this? This is not effective. At all. Let the nurses take care of your mom. She, she's in good hands. Go. You have a lot, of, you have a lot to do. You have a, you have a sermon to write. You have a lot of things to, to, to prepare. You have a work, you have a job, you have kids to do, then you have kids, you have other things, hobbies, sports, whatever. You have places to travel. Like, seriously, he, she's, she's gotten taken care of. Pattern of the world. The pattern of the world, what does Paul say about the pattern of the world? He describes it as putting our own interests above others. Putting ourselves ahead of others. Notice that? Putting our, thinking of ourselves highly above others. Think of that we dictate what is effective and productive. And then neglect the fact that he's the one who's supposed to determine that and define that. So I, I, I confess that there are many times when I go to my mom, I'm going, why am I here? <laughs> right? It's just like, it's wasting my one hour or what, two hours of my time. Right? I, I can't even put my laptop here because you know, there's no Wi-Fi here. Right? So I can't even work on my own sermon. Right? Why am I here? But Paul, but Paul and through this passage, God reminds me that, no, just be present. Allow the Holy Spirit to do his thing here in this world. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in this room. Loving someone has a lot to do with self-sacrifice. Loving someone, loving God has a lot to do with self-sacrifice. And therefore, I urge you, Paul says, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices. It is hard. It is tough. Think about it. Coming to church. Coming to any events that our church holds. You go, why am I doing this? I have nobody there. I don't know anyone there. I have no friends there. I can't invite anybody there. But you never know that your presence is actually important. Your presence here today is important to somebody that you may not know. It's important to God. So, conform to the pattern of the world, we could always, you know, uh, describe it as, oh, this bad society, da da la But really, it's our natural inclinations. Pattern of the world is our natural tendency. Our natural tendency is to neglect, naturally tendency is to just avoid, because it's just not worthwhile. That's what it means when you're conforming to the pattern of the world. Then, Paul follows through. Paul follows with a different uh, conversation. Not really good, different, but he offers like a list of gifts, right? Remember? He says prophesying, teaching, leading, but he doesn't really explain it. Um, I've heard a lot of sermons and then they, they go into this really elaborate explanation of these gifts, rightly so. But that's really not his point here, was it? His point was just to list it, right? He just listed these things. But his ultimate goal was what? 
was to how to practice it, how to practice these gifts. And his ultimate rule of thumb was what? Verse 9. Everybody have that? Love must be sincere. Yeah, you practice these gifts. Yes, you serve at the church. Yes, you uh, serve at the community. But your love must be sincere. And we just have to go full circle. What does it mean to be sincere? Is to actually offer your bodies as living sacrifices. When we serve, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices in view of that. When we do anything, that's what we are to do, is to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, to put ourselves aside and put the people in front of us, ahead of us. Which could mean I learned when I'm serving my mom, when I'm at the presence of my mom, which means that to take off my watch and put it in my pocket, to put my phone silent and just leave it alone. Actually, sometimes I just leave it in the car, right? To give my full devotion and time to her. Agree? Love must be sincere. Anything that maybe is a hint of, a, of even in this room to put me ahead of God needs to be put away. Right? And that includes our phones. But not right now because I'm sure that you're reading your Bibles on your phone, so you don't have to put it away. <laughs> right? But really, seriously, putting others, even God, especially God, ahead of ourselves. That is, not that is the pattern of the world. The pattern of the world is telling you to, no, take out your phone. It's ringing. You gotta, you gotta read it. You gotta read the text, right? But that's the pattern of the world. We are not to conform to that. Okay, let's go on. Now let's conclude. Romans chapter 12, verse 12 to 15. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. When I was reflecting this passage, I, the first question that came up to my mind is, you know this whole suffering thing of my mom's condition? Who is this for, really? Who is this for? I, I could see where, you know, my mom's probably reflecting on this. Her mind is still sharp, uh, but her body is just completely not working. Um, there's more to say to that, but uh, I'll just leave it like that. But who is this really for? This suffering also is for me. Notice that I, like, for the past few sermons that uh, I've been talking about my experiences with my mom. And how God is revealing his grace and mercy to me through all that. I realized that, like, then it dawned on me and when I was praying before this sermon. It's like, ah, so really, one, another reason for suffering of others is that it's for us as people, God, to go alongside with him, to see the grace and mercy at work. To see God reveal through this work, his work, and through myself. Because to, to my mom... In, I am to reveal God, of who God is, to her. I know who lives in me. It's God. And is God really revealing himself through me in what I do for my mom? And that's what I wonder. And I hope that I am in my, during my presence. So when I was uh, sharing about how when I posted that photo on the, at VGH, I realized that after when I did that and people came alongside with it, I saw God's presence. I felt his presence. He revealed his grace and mercy to me. How? One of my friends uh, uh, messaged me with a prayer, and I'm going to read it to you. I wish I could post it up here, but I'll read it to you. He goes like this. Father, grant the Chan family and Jonathan's dad, in particular, unexplained peace. Unexplainable peace. To know that the woman they all love is in your hands. You are with them. Let peace descend we pray in Jesus' name, amen. That's it. He sent me that message at the text saying that this prayer, does it, so, does it show joyful in hope? Yes. Does it show patient in affliction? Yes. Does it show faithful in prayer? Yeah. All these things were all captured in this short prayer and I was floored. But most importantly, I know that my friend heard me. He heard me through that picture. He sent me that text without even saying that I'm going to pray for you. He just sent me this. And, then he, and, I, and I realized, you know what? My friend heard me. He heard me from a distance, knowing exactly my heart. And through that prayer, I realized I recognize God's grace and mercy. That God does not leave me. That God has not left me. That God is with me. And through my friend's prayer, 
He hears me. He hears my heart. So I shouldn't be afraid. I shouldn't fear. I have given and have I got, have I now regained hope? Yes. Has I found, have I found joy and hope? Yes. It's because my friend who loves God and who is a God fearer as me has joined with me and heard my prayer. And now he has prayed. See, folks, when, I, when you come to me and I pray for you and I say, let me pray for you, I don't just leave it as that. I remember this and I remember many cases that where my friends have prayed that they keep a journal. And, in the, and what really hits me hard with them is that they keep a journal and they book a date to revisit. And it's like, so it could be like three months later, but they call me going, John, how are you doing with this past prayer request that we've been praying for? Do you know how much I feel? Do you know what that makes me feel? like? I feel like, wow, you, you remembered? You've been journeying me with me for that long for the past three months? So folks, this is why I tell you, like uh, when I pray for you and then suddenly you, you hear out of the blue, Jonathan calls you up again, <laughs> right? Some of you have like, experienced that. They said, that, like, I said, yeah, you're in my journal. And I bookmark saying that I'm supposed to like, call you back in this three months time. Like, how do you feel when I do that? And I realized that to sum it all up, this is what it means when Paul says mourn with those who mourn. It's when we are together and when we are at this church and this community, when we say we pray for one another, we are actually living, offering our lives as living sacrifices because we are now carving out valuable time of our own day to actually stop what we're doing and think about Carmen or Vivian or Johnny or Kiefer, right? That we actually stop during the day and go, today, it's a Tuesday, I'll pray for her or him. Oh, look, it's today, I have to revisit. So I'll just ping her or Text, uh, text him to see how they're doing. That is offering ourselves as living sacrifices. I challenge you in your small groups to do the same. If you're in a cell group, do that. Challenge yourself to do that. Schedule dates where there's a name on each date. Not every day, but you know, however many people have come to you to pray for you, but to ask for prayer. Schedule it and say, for 10 minutes during my work day, I will pray for this person. Oh, look. I have to touch back and reconnect with them. And so, suffering does have a purpose. It's not just for the person who is a sufferer, but it's also for us who go alongside and mourn with them. That through that mourning, we see that co-suffering, we see the grace and mercy of God and experience how Jesus experienced of offering himself to us, that when we offer ourselves to others, we experience the grace and mercy as Jesus did. Amen?